reacting to external demands or instruction rather than in ways determined by his own interests and energies and power. He says we may admire what he does, but we despise what he is. For Humboldt, then, man is born to inquire and create. And when a man or a child chooses to inquire or create out of his own free choice, then he becomes in his own terms an artist rather than a tool of production or a well-trained parent. Hello and welcome to episode number 40 of the Diet Soap podcast, entitled The Crisis and the Growth Economy. I'm Douglas Lane, the host of this podcast, and this is going out on Friday, January 15th, 2010. The guest this week is Takis Fotopoulos. Takis is the political philosopher and economist who founded the Inclusive Democracy Movement, He is a libertarian socialist, or more simply, an anarchist, and it was an honor to talk to him and a great pleasure to edit together this conversation. I'd planned to put this episode together earlier, but my original recording was uh, too muddy, and it was only after Mr. Fotopoulos uh, contacted me to let me know he had made his own recording of his half of the conversation that it became clear that I was going to be able to salvage uh, the conversation after all. So thank you, Takis, for your insight and for planning ahead. But before we get to that interview, I want to thank everyone who emailed me last week. Specifically, uh, I want to thank Rick B., Brian W., Albert J., and Ken H., who all let me know that they appreciated the conversation from last week with Chris Carlson of Process World. And uh, I want to say thank you to everyone who has written about the upcoming Transitional Alchemy Tour event with KMO of the Sea Realm Podcast and Neil Kramer of the blog The Cleaver. Neil and KMO will be here in less than a week. And I have confirmed a spot through Jason R. at the Lucky Lab Beer Hall. Last week I gave the wrong address, though, for that event. The Lucky Lab Beer Hall is on Northwest Quimby. That's 1945 Northwest Quimby in Portland, Oregon. There will also be an event on January 21st, hopefully. That's next Thursday at Portland State University. A room or a building assigned for that. But if you write to me at Doug Lane, that's Doug Lane at yahoo.com this time. Um, that's the email that's working. I'll be sure to write back uh, with the information on that PSU or Portland State University event when I have that information. I'll probably post a brief audio announcement on PSU and Lucky Lab event sometime very soon, right here on this very RSS feed. So just as soon as I have those details, the final ones on Portland State lockdown, I'll be putting up another uh, brief podcast. If you're planning on showing up at either event, please do bring your friends with you. Uh, it would be great to see a lot of people there. Get a good turnout for this. Um, Neil and KMO have come a long way, so bring everybody. Also, if you'd like a JPEG poster for the event, email me and I'll send one your way. Put together one that's quite orange. Anyway, that's just about everything that I need to get out of the way here at the beginning. We'll be listening to the political philosopher Takas Fotopoulos right after this fade out of Tibet to Timbuktu's Dali Wola. Takis Fotopoulos, you are the a political philosopher and economist who founded the Inclusive Democracy Movement. You are noted for your synthesis of classical democracy with libertarian socialism or anarchism, and you are the editor of the International Journal of Inclusive Democracy. You are also the author of uh, the book Towards an Inclusive Democracy, 
And uh, that was a very brief bio. Do you have anything that you'd like to, to add to that? No, I would say that's okay, that's about okay. Uh, although you could add, of course, that uh, apart from uh, toward an inclusive democracy, uh, I have published a series of uh, other books uh, in other languages, uh, and uh, in English as well, the multidimensional crisis, and also the latest one on the Iran crisis. Uh, but anyway, it's up to you. So you, you have written a book recently about the I Iranian uh, situation. When did that come out? Uh, it has, uh, yeah, it came out uh, online uh, a few months ago. I was actually looking at that before I called you, I think. I was reading about your views of, about Noam Chomsky's views uh, of the Iranian election. And I was not completely surprised, but somewhat surprised to see you being a, uh, as critical as you were of what are considered pretty uh, far-left figures here, like Noam Chomsky and, and Slavov Zizek. Yeah, I don't agree at all with their approach on the matter, but anyway, yeah. Well, no, I, go ahead. What, what, would, what is the primary difference between your version of libertarian socialism and someone like Noam Chomsky's version of the same? Yeah, um, first I don't agree actually that uh, Chomsky is uh, a libertarian socialist, at least in the sense that uh, the term is usually defined. That is, uh, uh, Chomsky is basically a kind of uh, mix of uh, liberalism and uh, uh, so socialist statism rather than libertarian socialist. That is, uh, this is not my view only, but uh, Murray Buchner well, uh, was arguing something of the same. That is, that uh, Chomsky uh, support for the uh, state in order to sort out our problems and then to move to a different states and so on has nothing to do with libertarian socialism. And um, actually, I've written a small book criticizing both uh, Chomsky and uh, Albert, uh, in, uh, um, uh, that is both the kind of libertarian socialism and uh, the kind of uh, libertarian theory used by Chomsky and also the Paracon theory uh, developed by uh, Albert. What strikes me about Chomsky and, and other reformist anarchists like him is that uh, they may espouse an anarchist position when talking about the things that they would like to see in the world, but when it comes to practical, everyday issues, they tend to abandon their principles. And it strikes me that the first hurdle one must overcome when, when you're proposing an alternative system to the current system is, that, is this idea that the current economic order is somehow natural and that it's unrealistic to, to try to go beyond it. Yeah, in fact, as you know, uh, anarchy was always a synthesis between uh, liberalism and socialism. This is how it uh, began and how it developed. And it is exactly this division within the anarchist movement between these two trends that have created also the corresponding currents within uh, anarchy. That is, that's why we had individual anarchists and then we had libertarian uh, socialists and so on. So the more somebody uh, uh, declaring himself an anarchist tends towards the liberal tradition, then the more you see this kind of liberalism prevailing uh, over the socialist principles and vice versa. And I think that uh, Chomsky, uh, that's why he's so much an admirer of liberal philosophers like uh, John Stuart Mill, etc., because um, he's very much influenced by this uh, kind of trend within uh, the anarchist movement and of course he's also influenced by the syndicalist uh, trends and uh, this is uh, a mixture that uh, he's trying to present which however as you mentioned uh, does not give us 
not only any transitional strategy of how we move from here to there, but also leads to uh, blatant contradictions, uh, that is, uh, how you could support Obama or previously uh, whoever was a Democratic president, etc., and, and at the same time uh, calling yourself an anarchist, and how you could call for state action, for expansion of state, rather, in order to uh, sort out the present uh, crisis or even previous crisis and so on, as if the state is something different from the economic elites, as if, in other words, there is no clear interconnection between the political and the economic elites, and the, the political elites are actually very much dependent or interdependent with the economic elites. So how you can separate them and just say that through popular pressure, the political elites would be able to fight the economic elite. I don't think that all this uh, sort of argument has anything to do with uh, the libertarian tradition. Well, I, I would tend to agree with you. Um, it's interesting to me, though, that uh, when, you've, when someone makes that argument, the general response is not to uh, try to discredit the notion that there's a connection between the political elites and the economic elites. Even Chomsky would agree that there's an obvious connection, that these are often the same, very same people. Yeah, okay, he would agree. But on the other hand, he would uh, continually saying that we have to press the political elite, which could play somehow uh, an independent uh, role or relatively independent role with respect to the economic elites and respond to the popular pressure. Now, when you say this, then... In fact, you accept the argument that uh, political elites somehow are controlled or could be controlled by uh, the people, which uh, I don't think has anything to do with reality today. That is, uh, the, sometimes the interests of political elites could be compatible with the interests of economic elites and to some extent of the uh, demands of the people. This happened, for example, during the statist period, as I call it, between 1945 and 1975, when Keynesian was dominant and when uh, the social democracy was uh, flourishing, uh, both in Europe and to some extent in the United States. At that time, yeah, this some, this uh, coincidence, if you like, of uh, the interests of the economic elites with the interests of the political elites and uh, the demands of the people from below uh, was there. But this was only a very brief interlude, I would say, within the capitalist uh, uh, system theory, uh, history. If we look at the uh, history since the beginning of 19th century, the trend was always for the minimization of social controls on markets, not the other way around. It was only in this uh, period of 30 years between 1945 and 1975 that what Chomsky and others uh, argue for was reality in the capitalist system, not in any other period to such, extent, such an extent before or after. So why this? I think that the explanation for this is that once the uh, uh, capitalist market economy uh, developed in the beginning uh, of the 19th century, then a new system was created which had nothing to do with the markets that uh, were prevailing up to then. That is, the, a new market system, as we may call it, developed a self-regulated self system which had its own dynamic and which led, on the one hand, to a continuous threat uh, to minimize uh, control, social controls on markets, not regular control, that is not controls to stabilize the markets, etc. That's a different thing, but social control, that is controls imposed by the uh, struggle of uh, the working class and uh, other popular strata and so on, uh, in order to self-protect from the effects of the market itself. So there was this uh, marketization process, uh, according to which the political and economic elites were pressing to 
minimize social control because that was for efficiency to be maximized and therefore for profits to be maximized. And on the other hand, there was also a process of growth that started with this uh, rise of the market system. And this has led to the present uh, growth economy and so on. Now, uh, Chomsky does not accept this sort of argument. Uh, he argues that the market system was working okay until about the beginning of the 20th century when corporations developed and uh, took over power. That, in other words, all that we have to blame the capitalist system is for corporate capitalism. I don't agree with it. I don't agree that we can separate corporate capitalism from the market system itself. In other words, it is within the dynamic of the market to develop into a corporate capitalism, if you like to call it uh, like this. There was, uh, in other words, no mythical good capitalism which developed at the beginning and then uh, during the process uh, developed into corporate capitalism and therefore what we have to fight is, capital, is corporate capitalism because that's what Chomsky argued that if we can somehow take over power from corporations and therefore um, we develop a kind of uh, liberal capitalism where the market works as it should work as it was described by uh, liberal philosophers and uh, political economists of the 19th century, then that would be okay. I don't agree with this. I think this uh, does not see that uh, there is a dynamic within the capitalist market system that once you have a market system developing, then it is the uh, an offspring of this dynamic that units would become bigger and bigger as they try to invest more uh, in new methods of production, in uh, new products and so on, so that they could become more competitive. So it is this grow or die competition that creates this concentration of economic power. It's not, in other words, something accidental. It's within the dynamics of the system itself to create this huge concentration of power we have today. And in fact, according to uh, the approach I'm supporting in the Inclusive Democracy Project, the ultimate cause of any kind of crisis we have today, of the economic crisis, of the social crisis, of the political crisis, and even more so of the ecological crisis, the ultimate cause is this concentration of power that had begun with the establishment of the capitalist market system at the beginning of the 19th century and the parallel establishment of representative so-called democracy. That is, the two are complementary, that is, the, on the economic level we have this uh, market system and on the political level we have the development of market uh, of uh, um, representative democracy which played exactly the same role of securing in other words the concentration of political power in a similar way as the market system was securing the concentration of economic power so i can show you if you like why it is this concentration of power at all levels that has led to the present multidimensional crisis mm -hmm. You gave a great overview there of, of your position, and I tend to agree with it. Um, what I think is most troubling for me these days is not that I find people like Chomsky or others taking a position which, like the one you described, which ends up being sort of a libertarian position. If we could just have perfect markets without these state-created corporations uh, interfering with the perfect market, then we would have a better society. I don't actually think that's what liberal reformists like Chomsky tend to advocate for. I, I think instead they just take the corporate capitalist system, the free market system, as it is, as for granted, as, as something that can't be changed, even as they seem to advocate change. In fact, what I'm saying is that there is no possibility of overcoming this multidimensional crisis I mentioned within the system. It's only from without this can, this can be done. You will not be able to stay home, brother. 
be able to plug in, turn on, and cop out. You will not be able to lose yourself on stag and skip out for beer during commercials because the revolution will not be televised. The revolution will not be televised. The revolution will not be brought to you by the rocks and four parts without commercial interruptions. The revolution will not show you pictures of Nixon blowing a bugle and leading a charge by John Mitchell, General Abrams, and Spiro Agnew to eat hog moths confiscated from a Harlem sanctuary. The revolution will not be televised. The revolution will not be brought to you by the shape of a war theater and will not star Natalie Woods and Steve McQueen or Bullwinkle and Julia. The revolution will not give your mouth sex appeal. The revolution will not get rid of the nub. The revolution will not make you look five pounds thinner because the revolution will not be televised, brother. There will be no pictures of you and Willie Mae pushing that shopping cart down the block on the dead run or trying to slide that color TV into a stolen ambulance. NBC will not be able to predict the winner at 8.32 on the court from 29 district. The revolution will not be televised. There will be no pictures of pigs shooting down brothers on the instant replay. There will be no pictures of pigs shooting down brothers on the instant replay. The revolution will not be right back after a message about a white tornado, white lightning, or white people. You will not have to worry about a dove in your bedroom, the tiger in your tank, or the giant in your toilet bowl. The revolution will not go better with coke. The revolution will not fight germs that may cause bad breath. The revolution will put you in the driver's seat. The revolution will not be televised, will not be televised, will not be televised, will not be televised. The revolution will be no rerun, brothers. The revolution will be live. If you try reforms and improvements of uh, the economic system, First of all, these uh, kind of reforms are not feasible anymore. That is, as I said, it was possible up to 1975 when still the market system was based on national markets, uh, but not since then when the present globalized system developed. In other words, today we live in a globalized market economy, or I would call better internationalized market economy, but anyway. And uh, in this uh, globalized market economy, there is no possibility of any single state or even a block of states to impose measures to effectively control the markets for social purposes. Because if any state or even a block of states, like for example the European Union, attempts to introduce a kind of uh, state control, effective state control, like the one suggested by Chomsky and others, to um, protect labor or to protect environment, etc. Then, given the present opening and deregulation of uh, world markets, immediately this country or the corresponding block of countries would face a more serious economic crisis. That is, uh, the currency would uh, suffer, there would be a currency crisis, there would be a crisis in the stock exchange, simply because capital would start moving from this country or this block of countries to other countries, to other paradises like China or India or Brazil or whatever. That is, uh, given the present uh, high flexibility, the first time ever in history we had such a, a flexibility of movement in uh, the capital markets, in uh, commodity markets and so on, Given uh, this uh, complete uh, almost uh, opening and the regulation of markets, there is nothing to uh, press the state in a particular country or block of countries to stay there if conditions are not maximal. And this is actually, as you mentioned in the beginning, the uh, present financial crisis, this is actually how the present crisis began. I do not uh, agree with the Marxist argument that uh, we simply have a crisis of um, overaccumulation. I think this is not supported either theoretically or empirically. First of all, because uh, the data show so uh, show that uh, this is not a problem. That uh, the world GDP, for example, was rising by three percent for the entire period from 1990 up to 2006, just be before the crisis. And uh, the same uh, applies to world trade and so on. There was nothing wrong with that. 
In other words, the problem was not a problem of uh, overaccumulation or underconsumption because of the unequal distribution of income, as Marxists argue. This is the typical Marxist argument. They simply try, I think, to fit the present reality into a model that was developed for a very different kind of situation, for a, a capitalist market which was controlled by the state to some extent, in the sense that regulatory controls could be effectively imposed in each nation state, given that it was the internal, the domestic market that was determining growth. But today this is not so anymore in the last uh, 25 years or so since uh, the present globalization uh, developed. It's not any state that um, controls effectively or could, not, uh, could control effectively its domestic market simply because it has to have uh, open and uh, deregulated markets and therefore capital and commodities go in and out of the country without any effective control by the state. Therefore, within this framework, uh, you can explain, and I try to do so in uh, um, a recent long article on the crisis, that it is a systemic crisis because it has been created by the system of the capitalist market economy, but not in the sense of overaccumulation, but in the sense that once this uh, globalization process started, which was set in motion by the expansion of uh, transnational corporations in the 70s and so on. In other words, <clears throat> this neoliberal globalization it's not, is not just a policy change, as uh, reformist uh, Marxists and uh, reformist libertarians and, and others uh, suggest. It's a structural change. In other words, it was uh, no spring of the dynamics of the market economy I mentioned before, and of course also this was interrelated with the fact that there was uh, uh, a co near collapse of the trade union movement, the labor movement, and the social movement in general. So the combination of these two factors, the objective factor of the expansion of multinational corporations and of the, on the subjective side of the collapse of the old socialist and labor movement, had the effect that uh, this informal at the beginning opening and deregulation of markets that began by the transnational corporation, later was institutionalized, first by that, the Thatcher government in Britain, then by the Reagan government in the USA, which introduced the various laws and regulations that institutionalized this informal opening and deregulation of markets. Now, once this happens, then you can explain everything uh, that uh, is going on today. That is, once the Chinese, for example, economy was integrated into this uh, world system and opened its markets and deregulated them as well to a significant extent, then huge amounts of capital started moving from the West into the East, not only China, but also later on India and so on. Why? Because there were paradises of uh, cheap cost of production. So they were moving there, and we had the process of deindustrialization here in the West. And on the other hand, we had all this uh, tremendous uh, expansion of uh, production and uh, industry and so on in um, uh, China and uh, similar countries. Now, this had created huge surpluses. In other words, it's not the surplus, as Marxists argue, created by uh, underconsumption and uh, overproduction that was uh, put into the financial markets that created the financial uh, bubbles, the speculative bubble. In fact, it's something very different. It's the huge amounts of capital that were invested by the Chinese and uh, the Indians and the uh, multimillionaires from Eastern European countries like uh, Russia, etc. All these huge amounts of capital were invested in the West in uh, uh, stocks and uh, bonds and so on and created a huge liquidity, created in other words a lot of money available for any kind of purpose and particularly financial purpose. So, this is how the present financial crisis started. In other words, you have to refer to the entire set of changes 
that were created by globalization, that is, the opening and deregulation of commodity markets, of capital markets, to some extent of labor markets as well. It was a combination of these factors that led to the creation of these speculative uh, bubbles and then to the present crisis we face. That means, to come back to your question, that you cannot today introduce any kind of effective social control on markets in order to improve the system, unless, in other words, you overturn the entire system, and in particular the globalized market economy that has been created uh, because of the dynamics of the system, and also the institutions of um, representative democracy, which, as I said, only secure the concentration of political power in a few hands, unless, in other words, you overturn the system and create a new system where you secure at the institutional level, of course, everything depends then also on the level of consciousness, but I mean at the institutional level, if you create institutions which secure the equal distribution of economic power and political power and generally social power, then and only then you can overcome the present crisis, and not only this, but you can also create a society where people can secure their individual and collective autonomy. And this is what uh, the Inclusive Democracy Project is about. I think there's a, a few things to unpack there. Uh, you know, first of all, what I, I want to differentiate, and you differentiated, differentiated this a few times, um, the difference between your perspective and the typical Marxist perspective about overaccumulation driving the crisis. Now, you've said that um, it was the financialization of the market, that, that basically it was the <clears throat> investment of capital in the, in the Western stock market and, and other financial ventures that led to a speculative bubble. Yeah, what happened was that uh, the elites of uh, these new economic miracles, as they're called, like uh, China and India and so on, instead of uh, reinvesting the surpluses created by the uh, hu huge rise in exports they had, because as I said, there was deindustrialization in the West, capital from the West moved in China, etc. Uh, subsidiaries of transnationals and so on, and this is how this huge business of made in China and so on uh, were created. In other words, China has been converted into a kind of assembly line of the West. Now, this process, however, has created huge uh, surpluses in China because of the expansion of exports, that is, any subsidiary in China, etc., which exports money to the West, um, obviously creates uh, local income in the sense of uh, not only the small wages uh, they pay, but also in the sense of taxes they pay to the government, etc. So this creates a kind of surplus in China, India, etc. And the local elites, instead of reinvesting this surplus uh, in improving the uh, uh, state of the health, education, etc., in creating some kind of uh, social welfare system which is uh, very lacking now, especially in China after the collapse of the Maoist regime. Uh, instead of doing this, they simply reinvested the money that was coming into in China, they reinvested it in the, uh, in the West, in uh, the capital stock markets, etc., and uh, therefore this created all this huge liquidity, I said, in the West, that was then uh, the main source of the present financial uh, speculation. Okay, okay, but what I want to understand is, on the, on the Western side, was what drove the deindustrialization, other than just a, uh, the natural tendency of capitalism to seek cheap labor, and also uh, to understand how the surplus in China, creating this liquidity, isn't a, an example of, of overaccumulation. Maybe I'm not understanding the original Marxist uh, concept well, but uh, could you make that distinction for me? It's not a kind of overaccumulation, even at the world level, because uh, that's what you mean now, whether we have at the world level a process of overaccumulation, where instead of having uh, overaccumulation only in the capitalist, the traditional capitalist metropolitan centers, I mean uh, USA, Europe, and so on, but uh, whether we, we could say that we have an overaccumulation process at the world level, 
uh, if we take into account the accumulation going on in China, India, etc. Uh, this is your question. Uh, no, I don't think that you can say it even at this level because if there was an overaccumulation there and uh, correspondingly an underconsumption in the rest of the world, then you wouldn't say you wouldn't have all this uh, very healthy growth of uh, gross domestic production and uh, uh, world trade, etc., that was going on up to 19, um, up to 2007, 2008. In other words, according to the overaccumulation approach. Once this process of overaccumulation starts and you have overproduction and underconsumption because of the unequal distribution of income, then this creates recession. But far from having recession, we have the continuous expansion all these years. The recession started as a result of the present financial crisis. That's a different thing. But up to a couple of years ago, we did not have any world recession. So how you could say, in fact, that China, etc., were growing with a huge growth rates of uh, over 10 percent, etc. So how you could talk about overaccumulation when, instead of having recession uh, at the world level, uh, or even at uh, the level of each particular uh, country, although, as I said, uh, uh, countries do not matter anymore as much as before, given the globalization process, but instead of having a recession, we had a continuous expansion. So you have to look at different causes of the present crisis, uh, like the ones I mentioned, rather than just the traditional uh, uh, cause of uh, overaccumulation, which was valid when, as I said, capitalism uh, was a domestic, uh, was um, rather uh, focused on the domestic markets, rather than as at present when capitalism is not motivated anymore by the domestic market, is not uh, the main motor of development and growth, is not anymore the domestic market, but it is a global market. That's a very different situation, which I think uh, Marxists uh, did not uh, realize because they tried to explain everything in terms of the uh, theoretical tools developed by uh, Marx and uh, his uh, successors in the 20th century. Uh, rather than by trying to develop a completely different theory to explain the present globalization. Instead, they see globalization just as a continuation of what was going on at the beginning of the 20th century and so on, which is completely wrong, because at that time we did not have multinationals. It was only in the last uh, 30 years or so that this phenomenon developed. So that's why they need a completely different approach to explain present phenomena, but instead they back to the original uh, classical models, which I don't think uh, represent today's reality. You said earlier that uh, in the 70s and 80s, something changed in the way capitalism functioned, that there was a structural change with the uh, rise of Thatcherism and Reaganism, and that uh, that we need to account for that structural change. Um, and this, is, and this change also accounts for why a statist solution isn't open to us anymore. Um, could you explain that a little bit more as to what that structural change was? Yeah, the structural change was that um, in, the, in the 70s we had a tremendous expansion of uh, this new phenomenon I mentioned, the uh, multinational or transnational corporation which, in fact, were not just exporting commodities to other parts of the world, as it, as it was the typical uh, example of what was going on in previous so-called uh, uh, globalizations. Now we had a new kind of production unit, uh, the multinational corporation, which produces and, and distributes uh, products all over the world. In other words, it has uh, subsidiaries producing wherever it's cheaper to produce parts of uh, the production process or even the entire production process. And uh, also it has the means to distribute, to secure the distribution of these products. Now, this is a new phenomenon which had tremendous implications because for this kind of expansion to continue, you have to have open and deregulated markets. If, in other words, you have a closed commodity market, or more or less closed, as it was the case up to then, and uh, more or 
less closed capital markets, in other words, where both the movement of capital and the movement of commodities were strictly controlled, if you have this kind of markets, then uh, obviously this uh, process within which uh, transnational corporations flourished, it's impossible. So that's why they pressed at the beginning informally, as I said, through the creation of the euro dollar market and so on, they pressed for the for lifting all these restrictions on capital markets and uh, on commodity markets and so on. As regards to commodity markets, of course, the, <coughs> the process of liberating markets has already started with the various uh, rounds of uh, reducing tariffs and trade before the creation of, uh, through the GATT, the general agreement uh, on tariffs and trade, and uh, later on by the World Trade Organization. But apart from this, <coughs> these uh, transnational corporations pressed for the lifting of the capital control, because up to then they were very, uh, during the statist period, in other words, uh, 45 to 75, I mentioned before, there were strict controls, exchange controls, uh, controls on the movement of capital. And this is how actually the social democracy uh, was possible to achieve the uh, desired aims. In other words, you cannot, as I said before, you cannot have a, a social welfare state in uh, your country when uh, the markets are open and liberated. But at that time, when markets are more or less closed, both the commodity markets, although of course there was trade, but Again, it was not as free as it is today, and also capital was uh, strictly controlled. So, to avoid all these kind of restrictions, transnational corporations pressed informally at the beginning by the creation of these informal markets like the euro-dollar market to avoid the controls of uh, the federal government in the USA and other governments in Europe, etc. Later on, uh, Thatcher and uh, Reagan simply institutionalized this process. In other words, uh, because of the objective and the subjective factors I mentioned before, uh, the neoliberal movement developed first in academic circles, the Chicago School, etc., and then at the political level, uh, and the neoliberal governments took over in uh, USA, Britain, and then all over the world which uh, began uh, implementing the, op the opening and the liberating of all markets. That was the essence of globalization. And in fact, uh, this was not reversed, as some people argue, be because of the present crisis. That is, uh, all this uh, nonsense uh, in Congress and so on about the economy becoming socialized and so on, because... Uh, uh, the state, the federal government, the USA, or governments in uh, Europe, had to take some action to overcome the effects of uh, uh, the present financial crisis. Have nothing to do, of course, with any kind of socialization of the economy. What happened is that uh, they socialized losses. That is, there were huge losses within this uh, uh, huge financial game and uh, somebody had to pay for these losses. And obviously not the bankers and not the speculators and so on. And that's how the state had to intervene in order to save the banking system, but through or at the expense of uh, taxpayers who had to pay for the huge amounts of money to create more li liquidity within the banking system, etc. That means that in the near future for uh, 10 years or so, peoples in Europe and in the USA, they will have to repay all these huge debts that have been created because of government borrowing uh, and because of this process of socialization of losses. And this means what? This means that any hope of any kind of expansion of uh, social provision in terms of uh, health, education, etc., is foregone. In Britain, for example, they discuss now huge cuts in public spending and in education, health, and so on, because this is the only way they can pay for the huge debt they have created. And of course, it's the lower income strata, strat it's the lower social groups that are going to pay for the crisis. So this has nothing to do with any kind of return to Keynesianism, as is the myth of some reformists or the 
return to some kind of uh, nationalization, etc. It's just the nationalization of losses, not of the system. And, you know, it strikes me that, uh, in fact, it's the opposite yes. of, uh, of what, what is being claimed. It's not that the, the state is taking control of the banking system, but that the banking system is taking even firmer control of, of the state. Yes. Uh, what, what stopped Obama or, or anyone from uh, taking a statist position and nationalizing uh, the banks and, and actually, you know, writing down the losses and, and, and taking state control uh, of the banking system. What, what would have happened if, if that had been attempted? Yeah, if uh, <laughs> this utopian state of affairs were created and a president like Obama uh, would attempt to nationalize banks, then unless uh, he has in the meantime created also the infrastructure for the economy, the rest of the economy to work, then uh, the economy would be in, in an immediate crisis. That is, uh, as I said, because of the opening, uh, because of the fact that markets, capital markets are completely open, unless, of course, at the same time uh, he closes the uh, capital markets and uh, forbids, uh, in other words, uh, restores the, all the financial controls, exchange controls, and so on that existed in the 50s, 60s, and the 70s. Okay, unless he does all this, then uh, obviously this is going to create a serious uh, crisis, a serious currency crisis, a serious stock exchange crisis, and so on. And uh, the result would be a much more serious crisis than the present crisis. If you can imagine this uh, uh, science fiction uh, scenario where the president at the same time that uh, nationalizes the banking sector, at the same time uh, introduces uh, strict controls on the movement of capital, on the movement of commodities, etc., then this could be feasible. But can you imagine this happening? It's simple economics. Today it's oil, right? In 10 or 15 years, food, plutonium, maybe even sooner. Now, what do you think that people are going to want us to do then? Ask them. Not now. Then. Ask them when they're running out. Ask them when there's no heat in their homes and they're cold. Ask them when their engines stop. Ask them when people who've never known hunger start going hungry. You want to know something? They won't want us to ask them. They'll just want us to get it for them. We can no longer even see how an insurrection might begin. Sixty years of pacification and containment of historical upheavals, sixty years of democratic anesthesia and the management of events, have dulled our perception of the real, our sense of the war in progress. We need to start by recovering this perception. It's useless to get indignant about openly unconstitutional laws. It's futile to legally protest the complete implosion of the legal framework. We have to get organized. It's useless to react to the news of the day. Instead, we should understand each report as a maneuver in a hostile field of strategies to be decoded, operations designed to provoke a specific reaction. It's these operations themselves that should be taken as the real information contained in these pieces of news. It's useless to wait for a breakthrough, for the revolution, the nuclear apocalypse, or a social movement. To go on waiting is madness. The catastrophe is not coming, it is here. We are already situated within the collapse of a civilization. It is within this reality that we must choose sides. To no longer wait is in one way or another to enter into the logic of insurrection. It is to once again hear the slight but always present trembling of terror in the voices of our leaders. Because governing has never been anything other than postponing by a thousand subterfuges the moment when the crowd will string you up and every act of government is nothing but a way of not losing control of the population. We're setting out from a point of extreme isolation, of extreme weakness, 
an insurrectional process must be built from the ground up. Nothing appears less likely than an insurrection, but nothing is more necessary. So that just about wraps up the 40th episode of the Diet Soap Podcast. You just heard the Colonel Bogey March as I read another excerpt from the Invisible Committee's The Coming Insurrection. And you are right now listening to the Blue Danube. Both the Blue Danube and Colonel Bogey are being performed by a calliope, which is a musical instrument that produces sound by sending a gas originally steam, or more recently compressed air, through large whistles, which were originally locomotive whistles. You might hear a calliope at a carnival, or while riding a carousel. Before that, you heard Gil Scott Heron's 1971 poem and song, The Revolution Will Not Be Televised, Will Not Be Televised, Will Not Be Televised. I should remind everyone that you can get your voice onto this podcast by calling 971-285-4604. Leave me a voicemail and tell me what's on your mind. It was a pleasure to talk to Takis Fotopoulos and to edit this conversation together. And you'll be hearing the second half of the conversation next week as we move beyond discussing why reforming the market economy won't alleviate the multidimensional crisis we're in, and start to talk about inclusive democracy as a better remedy for what ails us. I hope to see everyone who is here in Portland at next week's Transitional Alchemy event. That's with KMO of the Sea Realm Podcast and Neil Kramer of The Cleaver. All we've got left, though, between now and their arrival is my lovely wife, Miriam. But before we hear her factoid, her titanic factoid, I'd just like to remind you that the revolution will be live. People, I think, have heard of the unsinkable Molly Brown, but who was she and how did she earn the nickname Unsinkable? Maybe most of you have seen the, uh, Broadway, the Broadway musical about her, which I have not, but Margaret Tobin Brown, who was incidentally never called Molly in her lifetime, it was the wife of a Denver mining magnate. She was what they called then New Money and uh, was in lifeboat number six when quartermaster Hitchens, who actually had been at the wheel of the Titanic when it struck the iceberg, who was in charge, was infuriating everyone, particularly uh, Margaret Brown, by refusing to go back and rescue, rescue people. He also was generally rude, yelled at the men who were, who were rowing, and Molly Brown was infuriated by this, and she suggested that he hand over the tiller to a woman and help the other men row. He uh, refused, and she picked up an oar, began rowing, and she encouraged the other women to uh, do the same. And then later on, when the Carpathia, uh, the rescue ship, was sighted, Hitchens insisted that it had was not there to rescue them, but was only there to pick up dead bodies. So she threatened to throw Hitchens overboard, and uh, ordered those rowing to head for the Carpathia. And, of course, they were rescued. 
Her actions won her some acceptance by Denver Society later on, but the uh, musical was made after her death, and so she became famous for her boldness in Lifeboat Number 6, The Unsinkable Molly Brown. <laughs>